Welcome back. Uh, we're ready to jump into the next section of chapter two, which is all about water. Uh, we'll be discussing the properties of water and how they are critical to maintaining life. And then we'll wrap up by connecting this back to uh, part of the properties of living organisms. All right, let's jump in. So water is essential to life. Um, about 60 to 70% of your body is made up of water. And, you know, and even just on an individual cell level, uh, the you know, fluid inside the cell is, is water-based, it's called aqueous. Um, without it, life as we know it at least, uh, wouldn't exist. Now, that's not to say that there aren't maybe other types of life that might need something different than water, but what we're aware of and understand, it's, it's crucial. Um, this is also why astronomers, astrobiologists, and planetary scientists um, have been spending so much time and effort looking for even just trace amounts of water on other planets. Because if they can find any water, that may suggest that there's some sort of life there. Um, okay, so what are these key properties of water that we're going to be looking at? Um, water is polar. Water stabilizes temperatures. It's an excellent solvent and it's cohesive. All right, let's get into what all of those things mean. All right, so we'll start off with looking at the polarity of water. So hopefully you remember from the last lecture that water is a polar molecule. We have our oxygen and our two hydrogens and when they covalently bond, that bond is slightly polar. The oxygen draws the electrons closer into it, um, giving the oxygen a slight negative charge, and the two hydrogen uh, atoms are left with a slight positive charge. Um, so that molecule itself, you can kind of think of it like a magnet. The oxygen part is a little negative, the hydrogen part is a little positive, and it attracts other slightly negative and positive molecules namely other water molecules, right? Because every water molecule is polar. So they're attracted to each other. Uh, and you can see in my little drawing here, you can see where, you know, here we've got our oxygen that's a little negative. It's attracted to the slight positive charge of the uh, hydrogen atoms on other water molecules, all right? And so then they kind of stick to each other, that hydrogen bonding, right? Remember, it's not really strong. It's not like an ionic bond, but it's similar, just much, much less strong. Um, let's see. So what's really interesting about this is that uh, polar molecules are attracted to other polar molecules. But what about nonpolar molecules? Well, nonpolar molecules are repelled by bipolar things. They don't interact well. We have two special terms for this. So when we take water and we put something in it, we dump something in it, if that something is also polar, it will dissolve and mix. It'll all mix together. We call that hydrophilic, hydrophilic, water loving, okay? But what if you were to take something nonpolar like oil? If you dump olive oil into a glass of water, what happens? They separate, right? Uh, olive oil, any oil, is very, very non-polar, and it does not like to interact with polar things. We call that hydrophilic water hate, or excuse me, hydrophobic water hating, like a phobia, right? Um, and so they are water fearing, I suppose. Uh, so they separate, they stay away from each other. Uh, this plays into the next really important property of water. Or, oh, excuse me, it'll be in two. We're gonna look at temperature stabilization first. All right, so temperature stabilization. Uh, this is why it takes so long to boil a pot of water, right? They're staring, staring. Um, water, because of the hydrogen bonding, it can absorb a lot of heat energy, okay? Um, so it'll absorb in all this energy, and then finally, once you reach a certain point, there's enough energy in the system where then it'll you know, erupt, right? It'll start to boil. Um, when water boils, right, it's evaporating, but you don't actually have to reach 
boiling temperatures to have evaporation happen, right? If you, you've ever boiled a pot of water, you know that steam starts to rise far before you actually hit the boiling point. Um, and that's just the, that's what you can see. Uh, there's a constant flux of evaporation and condensation rain, right? Um, you know, it's a whole, it's a, a system, the, uh, the hydrologic system, um, but there's a, a constant flux of water evaporating and condensing back into, into liquid solution. Um, this, well, this allows for a great deal of energy to be absorbed, i.e. a lot of heat to be absorbed in the water before you actually see a temperature change. This is really cool, but it also has us really concerned, um, particularly when we talk about the climate, because the ocean can hold a lot of heat before we see temperature changes. But once the capacity for it to hold heat reaches a critical point, uh, it can only hold so much more heat, right? Uh, and we'll start, start to see big, big rises in temperature. It's one of the things climate scientists are really concerned about right now. Um, but other areas that we can think about this is, let's say you go for a run and you get really sweaty. Well, that, that water on your skin, that sweat, uh, it can evaporate. As it evaporates, energy goes out of the system, cooling you, okay? Um, so that's kind of the trade-off. Uh, you know, it'll cool your skin uh, as you release that heat out into the atmosphere. Now, we all, if you're down here in the south with us, uh, doesn't work quite as well because there's so much water in the air. Our humidity is really high. So when you sweat, it doesn't evaporate as readily. But, but if you live somewhere that's very arid, it works very well. <laughs> um, okay, and you can see we've got a little our little picture here. Uh, this is the lattice structure. Kind of had a similar, simpler version of this on the previous slide. So you can see how the um, the different bonds interact with each other. And then, so a cool, one of the cool things, right? Ice, uh, ice is less dense, so it floats in water. Um, in fact, with most solids, the solid is more dense and will sink, or at least stay like level, same density. Um, it's kind of a those interesting properties of water as well. Okay, now solvent. So like I mentioned two slides back when we talked about hydrophilic and hydrophobic, water is an excellent solvent of hydrophilic mixtures, solutions, okay? So, and this, is, this has to do with water's polar nature. So other ionic compounds, other polar molecules, they readily dissolve in water. They're hydrophilic, okay? Um, we refer to water as a solvent, solvent, um, because it's so, you know, anytime you dissolve things into it, right? So you dissolve things into the solvent, after you've done that, now you have a solution. Um, just a little, little bit of terminology stuff there for you. Um, in our little example here, we have uh, table salt, sodium chloride, uh, dissolved into water. So sodium chloride is an ionic compound, right? So it is polar and hydrophilic. And what happens is the waters are attracted to the sodium and the chloride as after they separate. Uh, and you can see in the little picture, uh, the different ends are attracted. So the, uh, let's see, the chloride ion is negative, it's our little green guy here, and the, um, the slightly positive uh, hydrogen end of water is attracted to it, makes these little spheres. And then the reverse is true for the sodium where the slightly negative oxygen is now attracted to the, uh, the sodium molecule. So you get these little spheres of hydration is what they're called, pretty neat. Okay. Now we've got another property that is uh, a direct consequence of all that hydrogen bonding again, and that is that water is cohesive. So what do I mean by cohesive? So in this case, we already know that water is attracted to other water molecules, um, and that's through right, these webs of hydrogen bonds. Um, we get, so that's, that's that cohesion. They like to stick together, they stay together. They're not 
you know, they're hydrogen bonded. They're not covalently bonded. Um, that cohesion, that attraction to other water molecules uh, gives rise to something we call surface tension. Basically, that there's enough hydrogen bonding at the surface of water that it actually uh, creates a little bit of uh, tension, stress, uh, a little bit of a barrier. Um, and you can see in the little picture here, a needle floating on top of water. Now, if you were to tap it, it'll sink down, right? As soon as any water goes over the top, it'll fall in. But you can very carefully float it on the surface. Um, and it's why, and this is a fun little experiment you can try on your own, go grab a quarter and very carefully drop water onto it. And you can form a bubble, right? A bubble across the top. Um, most of us have played around doing stuff like that, right? Um, if you have rubbing alcohol or nail polish remover, try doing it with that and see what happens. Those are two uh, fairly non-polar, um, or well, uh, rubbing alcohol is polar, but it's, it's different. It doesn't have this hydrogen bonding that we see with water. And uh, it, it won't, it won't form those little bubbles. Uh, little fun, fun little thing to try out. All right, so we've wrapped up the key properties of water, but we have one more thing to talk about in relation to water, and that is uh, buffers, pH acids, bases, okay? So in, in all living organisms, uh, there's a specific range of tolerance for just about everything. Uh, if you'll remember back when we discussed the properties of life in chapter one, we considered regulation and homeostasis. So, right, one of our examples for that was uh, maintaining body temperature. If you get too hot, you start to sweat to cool yourself back down. If you're too cold, you start to shiver to create um, heat, heat from friction from your muscles shivering. Uh, so that's one example. But the other, another important piece to that is that your cells have to maintain an appropriate pH as well. Your cells, your blood, all the aqueous solutions throughout your body need to be within a certain pH to function properly. Um, for example, uh, like the macromolecules, proteins, carbohydrates, we're gonna talk about them more in the next lecture, but if your pH is not in the appropriate range for your proteins, your proteins will unfold, they'll denature, and they won't be able to work properly. Uh, so that would, be, that would be very bad. Now, where, so imagine for a moment, like inside one of your cells, you need to maintain a particular pH, which is around neutral, we'll talk about that more later, um, but, for everything to function properly. But imagine in your stomach, it's very acidic. Well, why isn't that a problem? Uh, well, it's that acidic, uh, you know, your stomach acids are kept away from the inside of your cells. There's all sorts of lining to your stomach when it's working properly. So it can break down, denature the proteins that you eat and, and other things too. Okay, so let's, let's talk a bit about what I mean by pH. Um, so, the pH of a solution is me a measure of its acidity or its alkalinity, okay? So acid, base, alkalinity refers to base. Um, a pH test measures the amount of hydrogen ions that exist in a given solution. And the overall concentration of hydrogen ions is inversely related to its pH and can be measured on the pH scale. So a large concentration, a high concentration of um, of hydrogen ions uh, means a lower pH number. Uh, and the fewer hydrogen ions, the higher the pH number. So the scale is zero to 14, where pure water is, a, is neutral, and that's a seven. And then anything lower, less than seven is acidic, and anything above seven is basic alkaline is another word for that. All right, so acids, acidic solutions, are sub substances that provide hydrogen ions and have a lower pH number. Bases are sub substances that provide hydroxide ions, so OH negative, uh, and they raise the pH number. Most cells in our body, like I said before, right, they operate in this really narrow range um, from about 7.2 to 7.6. So just 
just slightly alkaline basic. Um, buffers readily absorb excess hydrogen and hydroxide ions. Um, so they keep the pH in the proper zone um, so that everything can function appropriately. So buffers are very, very important and every cell in your body, all of your fluids are, are buffered. They're buffered solutions to a point, you know, to a point um, to help keep that range. Now, if you were, if you were to inject yourself with an incredibly acidic solution, that your, your buffers wouldn't be able to manage it well enough. Um, so don't ever do that. That would be really bad. Um, but there are some things that can happen in your body, like ketosis, um, from like it can be a consequence of being diabetic that can cause your, your body fluids to become too basic. Uh, and that's very dangerous as well. Right. So, um, the buffers help, but they can only work within with so much excess. All right. So that wraps up, uh, our second lecture for chapter two on water. And I will see you back here for biological molecules.